Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, please do interrupt me if you have any questions. So that I think would be better than asking it at the back. So I'm going to talk to you about how nuclear physics can treat cancer, and in particular about the radiotherapy program that we have at Triumph. Uh, Triumph, um, for those of you who hadn't had the pleasure of visiting us, is a lab in Vancouver. This is a photo of Vancouver between the Pacific Ocean and the local mountains in the fall. It normally doesn't look like that. It normally is very rainy. But when it's beautiful, it, it's, it's quite good. Um, we are a national lab in Canada. The name is Tri University Mason Facility. It was founded in 1968 for the uh, three local universities at UBC, uh, Simon Fraser, and UVic. And at the first board meeting already, the fourth university, University of Alberta, joined. But that didn't make a good acronym, so, so we kept the name. So we are Triumph. Uh, we are 20 member universities from the East Coast to the West Coast, and of course, Toronto, University of Toronto is one of them. And in general, we are a nuclear and particle physics lab. So we know how to build accelerators. We build our own accelerators. We know how to operate them. We know detectors. We uh, build some parts of detectors for CERN. We, in principle, in general, know targets to make isotope production because mainly what we do at Triumph locally is produce radioactive beams to then do experiments. And in general, we know interactions of particles. And this here is a map of Triumph with the main cyclotron here. Uh, it's the largest cyclotron in the world. It accelerates protons or negative hydrogen ions to three quarters of the speed of light, 520 MeV. And, uh, and then it gets distributed into the different stations. And we also have a new e accelerator that's fairly new to us. Uh, and all those places in the red-green circles are actually sites that are applicable to medicine. For example, we have several small cyclotrons that their main purpose is to produce medical isotopes. We have chemistry labs that are used to process them. We have stations where we produce some more medical isotopes. We ran Canada's only potent therapy facility, and here we make some more medical isotopes. So most of what we do in the life science division, not all, but most of it, is geared towards the treatment of cancer. And cancer is not one cancer is not equal another cancer. So here you see a list of cancer occurrences in men and in women. And you see that a quarter of all cancer patients that are male have prostate cancer. And for example, 15 of, of them are lung cancer. And it's very similar with women with breast cancer and lung cancer. But you also then see when you look at the cancer mortality uh, that not each cancer is treated equally. So for example, the, the quarter of the prostate cancer uh, only 10% of the cancer deaths are actually prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is something that can be treated better than other cancers, while it's just the flip side for lung cancer, very similar for, for um, breast cancer. So you cannot just do one treatment for all different types of cancers. So you have to really tailor your cancer therapy to the individual treatment, the cancer, and the individual patient. So what do you do if you have cancer? So three of the, the main um, things that you can do, you can do surgery. You basically just cut it out if it's not next to a sensitive organ that you were damaged. You can do chemotherapy, where you're basically attacking the whole system with chemicals. Or you can use ionizing radiation. And uh, basically, in Canada, about 60% of all cancer patients receive radiotherapy, either alone or combined with the other two, but only 40% of the cures are actually to do radiotherapy. So we still have um, room for improvement in radiotherapy. And this basically shows you the, the difficult part in um, cancer therapy. And that's true for surgery, chemotherapy, and ionizing radiation. Here we have the tumor control probability. So 100% would mean that you kill the tumor. And here we have the normal tissue damage. 100% means you kill the and basically what you want to have is you want to have the tumor control curve as much as you can separated from the normal tissue complication curve. So you want to spread these out as far as possible in the dose. It can be radiation dose, it can be chemotherapy dose, it can be the damage for the surgery. And this is called a therapeutic index. So most, pretty much all of cancer research is to improve it is to increase the therapeutic index as, as much as possible. So how do you actually then kill a cancer cell with, with uh, ionizing radiation? Um, there are several ways to do that, but one that is really, really good is uh, basically to um, 
destroy the DNA in the cell. The DNA in the cell is there to, uh, that is needed for the cell to duplicate. Uh, and the cell goes through different cycles uh, where it's uh, basically looking, it's duplicating a lot of stuff, and then it's duplicating the chromosomes, and then it does its double checking and makes sure everything is fine, and then it actually divides. So what you really want to do is to hit the DNA in at least two parts, because if you're only doing it in one part, cells, even cancer cells, are very, very good in, in uh, repairing that by basically just copying something and moving it over. So we want to have at least two strand breaks, a double strand break. And again, we want to have that as much as possible in the uh, cancer cells and as little as possible in the healthy tissue because we want to increase the therapeutic index because truth be told, with ionizing radiation, you can kill anything and everything. So we want to keep the patient healthy and alive. So that's basically what we want to do. Now, we can use different radiation, uh, ionizing radiation to do that. And of course, quick summary, if you use protons or ions, uh, the particle go in into any matter and you have these ionization event, it goes in fairly straight, not much uh, scatter, and it stops at a predictable depth de um, depending on the initial energy. And then beta particle electrons, they scatter more, have other photons coming out. Um, um, gammas, uh, even more scatter, and then neutrons actually produce recall ions that then do the uh, recall protons that do the other damage. So they behave very differently, and basically you have charged particle and neutron particle, particles that interact directly and indirectly. So keep that in mind, what we can use it, uh, how we can use it for, for different type of cancer. Um, the other thing that is important is that the concept of linear energy transfer. So as you saw on the previous slide, um, these events happen spread out or very dense. So a particle with high LET has the ionization sites really, really, really dense. For example, ions, neutrons, or protons. And low LET particles have an ionization event maybe here and here. So they completely miss the DNA. So they will not destroy the DNA directly. But it's okay. Because in most can in cases, there's oxygen around. So the oxygen gets ionized. And all of a sudden, you have a free radical that then now can uh, attack your DNA when it, when it folds and whatnot. So you can destroy the DNA indirectly if there is oxygen around, if you have free radicals. Um, but there are... And, uh, Funnily enough, nature is actually quite kind to us in that in many cases cancer, you can do this, where the cancer is such that this works just fine. So you can use photons to treat cancer. So you have these small elinax, they, they fit into a room of this size. Um, they are, the local hospital, uh, Princess Market, has probably dozens in the basement. They're relatively inexpensive. They're about 1.5 million, and people have run them for, for decades. They really know how to tailor the radiation. But if you have a cancer where this doesn't work, for example, if you have a hypoxic cancer where there isn't that much oxygen or other factors, you really have to hit the DNA directly, and this is where the high LET particles come in with ions and neutrons. And the concept is the relative biological effectiveness because of this effect. Not destroy cells equally efficiently, even if you deposit the same physical dose. For example, here is again the survival. All cells are alive and then they die off. For a given dose in gray, um, you don't kill that much if you use photons. You kill certainly more with protons and you kill even more with alphas. So with increasing LET, you have a better rel relative biological effectiveness. Uh, and the other thing that comes back to the oxygen is that we have an oxygen enhancement ratio. So this uh, part here with photons works really well if you have oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, it doesn't work so well anymore. And that's uh, reflected in this, gra this graph. Here you have a lot of oxygen, and this, this cancer here is hypoxic, so you need to put a lot more dose into the hypoxic one to, to get the same um, cell kill. And both of them um, depend on LED and in this fashion. But those are the differences between the different particles and how you would um, use them for different types of cancers. Okay, so how does that now look for an external beam? So here we have the depth in tissue in, in, a, in a human. Uh, and here we have most of the deposit in the patient, which is the cell kill that you have. 
Here, for example, you have electrons, and typical electrons energy, they don't go very, very deep, and they are mainly used um, for skin melanomas or things like that. Then we also have the photons that we talked about. So we have some um, cell kill under the skin, and then we have the surface effect, and then it builds up, and then we have the, uh, the known um, exponential decay. And you can see that if you have your tumor about here, that most of the damage you're actually doing before you reach the tumor, and you have some damage behind it. But in most cases, that's fine, because you're not delivering the whole treatment in one shot. You're doing 20 to 30 fractions, like 20 to 30 treatments in a row. Someday you would come maybe from this direction, so you hit this healthy tissue in front of here, and the next day you would come from here. So you're spreading it out, but you're always hitting the tumor. Uh, but in case that the tumor is really hard to kill, you can use, for example, protons or heavy ions. There is, again, a little bit of cell kill at the surface, and then there is a, a plateau, and then at the end of the range at very low energy, you, of course, go into the Bragg peak, and you want to put your tumor about here. You can spread the Bragg peak out as well to cover the tumor. And the depth of the Bragg peak is only, for protons it's and ions, is only defined by the initial energy, and for protons, there really is nothing afterwards. You're really protecting the healthy tissue behind it completely, and you give some damage in front of it. Um, again, x-rays, they're the most common one. They are very, very um, popular. They are very well known. You have all these different techniques that you can use to protect the healthy tissue. Protons, to do this effectively for all different sizes of patients, uh, you need 230 MeV. So that's quite a sizable accelerator. Keep in mind one is 500. Um, so these um, accelerator complexes are expensive. Um, they used to be $200 million. They came down quite a bit uh, right now in the order of $50 million. But again, if you have a healthcare system, like all healthcare system that is cash strapped, you want to spend your, your money wisely, of course. And um, so how does it work typically? So typically you're giving the dose, not in one shot, you're spreading it out because you want to hit the cell cycle of the cancer cell and all of the different cells. Because if you are going in one cell cycle, the, the, the cells are less likely to get damaged than in other cells, and you don't know where they are. So you want to spread it out so you can really hit them in all cycles. Uh, for example, conventional um, treatment here, the dose rate, 0.0 grays per second, and you would do 20 to 30 fractions. And here we have an example of ha what would happen if you give the whole dose, for example, 34 grays in one shot at those, those low dose rates. So this is a pig skin. Pig skin is surprisingly similar to the human skin. And they're irradiated with slightly different uh, doses here. And you can see that a lot of the surface, actually, of the skin surface gets damaged. So you have burn spots. And then this was done first uh, in the 60s. And then I was kind of forgotten. And just recently, it, it uh, popped up again. And it's very popular right now. People thought, what actually happens if I go against conventional wisdom and I'm not spreading it out and I'm not having these low dose rates? What if I give the whole dose in less than a second? So they this, did this with this poor pig as well, and they gave the 40 grays in less than a second. And this is what you get. This was, by, by the way, this was done out of, of France. You basically get no damage to the tissue. So that's really exciting. So people got really excited about that. Um, right now, it's not really understood. People are coming up with all different hypotheses why this is this. One of them is that the tumor itself um, is already hypoxic, so it will behave the same way in either dose rate. Uh, by the way, the tumor um, behind it was killed the same way, so the, the efficiency of the, uh, the treatment was the same. It's just the healthy tissue here got damaged and here it didn't. So the tumor is the same, but the healthy tissue, if you give the dose in such a short amount of time, basically depletes the healthy tissue of oxygen, and all of a sudden you're making your healthy tissue hypoxic. So you're protecting it. So that's one of the theories right now. Uh, but uh, there are some experiments that see this effect and some experiments that don't see this effect. So we have to figure this out. Um, by the way, this experiment was done not with photons, but with electrons. And that's 
mainly because all the clinical accelerators that you use for this type of treatments, um, you have a, a, a linear accelerator that accelerates electrons. The electrons go onto, for example, a tungsten target, and then uh, when they smash into the target, they create all these x-rays that you then direct into the patient. And that um, process, of course, um, has a lot of losses. So for the flux of the electrons, you can't get these high, high fluxes that you need for the photons. So basically for these experiments, what people do is they remove the target from these electrons and use electrons. Okay, so this is what people see with electrons and it's called a flash effect. So this is not a fancy acronym. The French just decided to capitalize the whole thing. Um, <laughs> this is basically a treatment in a flash. Okay, so with electrons. Um, this is the first patient, I should have warned you, sorry. Um, this is the first patient that they treated last year. This is a patient who had a skin melanoma for years and years and years, reoccurring skin melanoma, and all the treatments didn't work. So they used this technique on him, and uh, in the paper uh, that came out, uh, it looks really, really good. And of course, now you have to follow up some, some time and see if it comes back or not. But it's very, very promising right now with electrons. Okay. So people have now um, tried this all over to figure out if they can reproduce these effects. And the funny thing is that there's this controversy. Some people can reproduce it and some people cannot reproduce it. Some people see it in cell samples, some people only see it in animals. So people are trying to figure out. So we in Vancouver are trying it too. This is Andrew Minchinton, he's a radiation biologist at our cancer agency. And this is how basically one of these ELINAX look like. Uh, that one was um, deemed too old, it was 10 years old for um, accelerator physicists that is no, no age, but it's not supported anymore, so that went to the scrapyard. And that's when you can come in and then do experiments. So we, st we stripped the, uh, the accelerator here, we took all the safety off, you take the target off, and then you can get really high dose rates for electrons. And uh, you can see here the head where the radiation comes out, everything is out, and here I hope you can see it as a sample with two mites. And uh, the dose rates are in the order of 260 grays per second, and these experiments are very new. They are still being analyzed, but it looks like we are more in the seen effect right now. Maybe our dose rates aren't high enough, so we will still need to figure that one out. Okay, but this is with electrons. Electrons are not that useful for treatment because as I showed you in the graph, they're not going deep enough into the patient. So why don't we use photons? And uh, at Triumph, we have our new electron um, linear accelerator here. Uh, it has an electron gun of 300 keV, 10 milliamps. And then we have different stages that accelerate the electrons. And in one of these stages here, uh, we are going to be at 10 MeV at this point. We have a beam dump where we then could try to, where we can convert the electrons into photons, and because our electron source is so bright, we can create a high enough flux with photons to get up in, in, the, in, the, in the dose rates. Uh, this is, uh, we got actually funding for that last year, and right now we are in the design phase. Uh, basically, the, uh, the photons, uh, the electrons will come, they will get converted, and then we're gonna place our biological samples here, which is basically uh, a nice word for mice. Um, that's the shielding that we're gonna do, and we designed it, and it looks pretty good, and our simulations show that we should get up to an average dose rates for photons of 300 grays per second. Um, right now, we passed our design reviews, and we're starting to build things, we're gonna install it, it should be installed and, and commissioned by the summer, and we're gonna do first irradiations with uh, biological samples in the fall. And then we can see what the effect is if you're doing it with photons versus electrons, if we see the same effect. Unfortunately, our electron accelerator wasn't really meant as a user facility where you go in and you change samples. And so when you go in, you wanna change something, by the time you go in and by the time you go out and then close everything up and bring the accelerator up, that's an hour. Um, that's really, really long for a mouse to be inside there and be <laughs> under. under. Uh, so we are playing around with how we can make this more efficiently. So at one point we were thinking of making an elevator paternoster for these mice but it turns out it's quite difficult to do that because there, we would have to have a lot of shielding in between the mice, so we were still trying to figure out how to do that. Okay, so that brings me then to the next particle that you can use, the protons, that has this nice peak, the Bragg peak. And the Bragg peak, of course, 
is basically just a representation of the, the beta equation, uh, which Hans Bethe um, did in 1930 and then 32 uh, for relativistic cases. And basically, it's just the loss of kinetic energy over unit distance is one over the kinetic energy and then an ln over the kinetic energy. So when you go to low energies, it sweeps up. And when you do this in depth in tissue, basically you sweep it up and then they all stop and that's why it, why it goes to zero. Uh, the first one that realized that this behavior could be really, really useful for treating cancer was Robert Wilson. Um, and this is a graph out of his paper for radiological use of fast protons. Uh, he also was the first director of Fermilab then for, for many, many years. So I gave a talk about Fermilab and I found it really nerve wracking because I wanted to say nothing wrong, but apparently I didn't. Okay, um, Okay. so he came up with the first idea. Uh, by the way, he came up with that idea probably a lot earlier during the war, and there was a publication and he couldn't, he couldn't put it out. And right now, there are about almost 100 centers around the world that use protons or heavy ions for treatment of cancer. You can see there are quite a few in the States. For us, the closest is in Seattle. Um, there are about 30 in Europe. There's one in South Africa, also they are gonna close now. There is one in India, several in China, quite a few in Japan. There will be one in Australia. And we had the only proton therapy facility in Canada at Triumph. Um, it was situated right here, the main cyclotron, this very small beam line here. We were in clinical operation since 1995. We only treated ocular melanomas. Uh, basically, that's very similar to skin mel melanoma. It's, you have a, a layer, the choroidal layer in the eye that has a lot of melanin, so you can actually um, have um, choroidal melanomas. And um, we've stopped clinical treatments um, a year ago. And that was because our facility had never been refurbished since 1995, and the equipment reached the end of its lifetime. And that triggered a review of our um, cancer agency that looked at the costs and everything and they determined because there are so many centers now in the States that it was more cost efficient to send our patients to the States. So we don't have a proton therapy facility in, in Canada anymore. There are plans announced that maybe there, there will be one in Montreal. There have been plans in the works for many years that there may be one in Toronto. By the way, if you do have certain type of cancers like a uh, brain tumor or you have a small child pediatrics tumor, uh, most likely, if it's clinical reasonable, you will get transferred to the States um, for treatment. So it's not that Canadians don't have access to proton therapy, but we don't have a, a treatment center in Canada. And the more and more that will happen, at some point it will be economical that we will have our own proton therapy facility. Okay, so here you have uh, the facility layout. There's the main cyclotron, the protons come. They're then shaped um, to go into the right depth, into the right size. This is uh, my student, Nick, who set model for this one. This is an actual patient. So you really have to fix the head really, really uh, close because the, the fall off of the Bragg peak is so sharp that you really want to make sure that you're hitting the tumor and nothing else so that the patient can't move. It was a very, very effective treatment in our center. Uh, we had about 40 patients per year from BC all the way to Quebec that had choroidal melanomas and that were sent to our ophthalmologist. She then picked uh, 30, 30 or so, they were treated with party therapy where you're in, um, inserting radioactive gold really close to the tumor because the tumor was of a size and a location that you could do that. Uh, but 10 of those patients, the, the tumor was too close to the optic nerve or the optic lens, so you would have destroyed those sensitive organs. So we only treated 10 patients a year, so it wasn't a very effective, uh, no, it was effective but not a very efficient um, cost balance. Um, so, but we did, we did a really, really good job. Here you can actually see from this image that this is the tumor before the treatment, and basically after the treatment, in this case, it was completely gone. You should see a little bit of a discoloration. The five-year local uh, control rate, which means that the tumor shrinks and goes away, was 91%, and keep in mind that we saw the quarter worse patient. Uh, when we adjusted, the, uh, we started out with a lower dose, and then we increased it from 50 to 60, uh, from uh, then it's even 97%. The metastasis-free survival rate was an excellent 82%, which is really high for cancer therapy. Um, these two numbers are different. 
because sometimes there was already a metastasis that had formed in, in another organ in the, in the kidney or the bones. And by the way, what, what was lethal wasn't the primary tumor, it was uh, the, the organ failure of those organs when, when it had um, traveled there. Um, the other thing to note is that in principle you could just treat a patient by taking the eye out because then you remove the cancer as well. But the survival rate is actually the same if you take the eye out or if you're doing proton therapy. But of course then you keep your eye and you keep in many cases close to 100% of the vision. And why this is important, I mean it's not just optics, but we had one patient who actually was a commercial truck driver. And he was so nervous because he wouldn't have just lost his eye he would have lost his livelihood because you can't have a commercial license if you only have one eye. Okay, so we treated uh, these patients and uh, one of the uh, particular thing uh, in our center is that, or was, that our fields, the size of the, the treatment site is incredibly small. I mean these treatment sites sometimes are only three millimeters in diameter, so very, very small. So when you normally do treatment, you get your beam with the psychotron and then you don't believe the operator of the psychotron that the beam is what you ordered. You need to measure it before you put it into a patient. So you need to measure the energy, you need to measure the dose rate, and, and so on and so forth. You need to measure the size. So for that, you normally use a detector to, to measure your particles. But typically, detectors are of this size here, while your size of tumor is this. So you can't measure your, your dose properly because here you measure nothing. So we started to look into optical fibers, using optical fibers, really, really small fibers to really measure that precisely. For example, they would be that small as that. And we had optical fibers, for example, here we have a plastic fiber where we drilled a hole into the end and we put some scintillator material into it, like gallox. And then, of course, the ionizing radiation comes in, excites, and then de-excitation light is what you get to your detector. Um, so when you do that, um, that was not a surprise. I mean, this is well known. This is Crystal, by the way, the PhD student. When you measure the Bragg peak, so here you move, um, you put your proton beam into a water phantom, and you move your detector along the beam axis through the water phantom, and you measure your Bragg peak. Um, typical detectors uh, are used uh, up about here. So they measure the beam, the Bragg peak height, uh, normalized to the entrance dose here, I zoomed in a little bit, four to one. Now, if you use scintillators or, or optical fibers, they measure the Bragg peak height a lot lower. Um, there's quenching. Um, not surprising. I mean, this is well known. Um, there are equations to correct for this, the, the crown Burks equation. Um, it's typically corrected if you're using it in any other field. But for medical physics, this isn't good enough. Because the whole point of this exercise is, is to measure the dose, not to measure something and then use a correction that is empirical and has some error to it especially because when you treat, you don't just use one Bragg peak, you step through the tumors, which is bigger with several Bragg peaks. Okay, so that's not practical for proton therapy. So we started to look into other materials of optical fibers to see if we could find one that actually uh, doesn't ex have this quenching. And we came, so we tried um, silica fibers, like glass fibers that were doped. Uh, we tried the copper and cerium doped ones, still not very good. We tried one with a stove with nitrogen. That was pretty exciting. This is where it should be. And then we got to gadolinium. And that's uh, really, really close to having no quenching. So gadolinium is, is a very interesting atom because uh, it has mainly just one transition. So that seems to help with the quenching. Uh, on the side note is also the, uh, the, the stable isotope with the highest neutron capture. So this is really exciting. We're now working on optimizing this, so we really have no quenching. And then we have a detector that will work for these small cases uh, really, really well. Having the Bragg peak is great for really conforming your, your treatment over the tumor and really hitting the tumor primarily. But it also has its downsides. Because normally when you do radiation therapy, if this is where your tumor is, and this, for example, is an organ at rest that you really don't want to hit because you would do too much damage. Uh, this is how it would look with photons. This is what, how it looks with protons. So the organ at rest gets a little bit with the photons. But you can actually measure these photons coming out. And very often in, in these, these Elinex, there is a detector in the bed, so you can measure it and you can make sure everything is going according to plan. With photons, nothing is coming out. And even worse, if you're making a slight mistake, or for example, between the different fractions, the patient gains weight, loses weight, 
wears different clothing, you could be off by a little bit, and all of a sudden your organ address gets hit by the protons. And this is still one of the outstanding physics issues in uh, proton therapy. How do you know where you're depositing your protons? How do you, can you make sure that you're hitting the tumor and not anything else that you don't want to hit? And there are different ways how to do that. So for example, you can measure the, uh, when you hit a patient with protons, you're actually producing PET isotopes. So you could measure the PET isotopes, but that's not a direct measurement. It's very time consuming. Or when you are, uh, measure, when you are hitting with, uh, with protons, for example, the brain, you're creating actually a lot of prompt radiation, a prompt gamma radiation that comes out that you can measure. Um, so for example, if this is the tumor, so we're hitting the healthy tissue and we get some sort of background noise. Now say in the tumor we put a metal marker and that metal marker has characteristic x-rays when it's hit by protons. So we get this. So all of a sudden we're hitting the metal marker and we have this line come out. So we know, well we don't really know that where the protons are. The only thing that we now know is that we're hitting the metal, but we don't know energy, so that's also not that useful. But if you're now choosing your metal marker in such a way that it has several of these x-rays um, that uh, have different cross-sections, so one of the cross-sections, uh, the, uh, the peak is very high at low energies and lower at high energies, and the other peak is just vice versa. So if you're hitting the metal marker at the right energy, the ratio will be so and if you're hitting it at the wrong energy, the ratio might be reversed. So all of a sudden, the only thing that you have to do is not measure one x-ray and then rely on Monte Carlo simulation to figure out and calibration. The only thing, if you have a metal like this, is you measure the ratio, which you can do in real time, really, really fast, and you know exactly what the proton energy is at that point. Yes? So you put these markers in in a way where they show the volume um, so it depends on which marker. But for example, um, the, the example that I'm going to show is where we're going to place a marker really, really close to it, not in the tumor. So it depends on the tumor. So some tumors, you, you don't really, uh, so metal markers, fiducial markers are widely used for um, placing around the tumor so you can see where the tumor is in an x-ray when you place the patient. We've done that with our choroidal melanomas as well. We actually sewed little tantalum clips around the tumor we would not put it into the tumor. Prostate cancer is something where you're actually putting metal markers into the tumor, so both cases can happen. Okay, so the only thing that we have to do if we choose the metal correctly is measure the ratio and we know what the energy is. So that with the energy then we know where the, uh, the range is. Okay, so we tried that actually at times. It's, uh, the idea was uh, from Dennis at Guelph and uh, one of the things that we ran into very early on is that we have this large background noise when we hit anything with this protons. So this is Eva, she's setting up a plastic phantom and we used uh, lantern and chromite detectors to start with. And if we're looking at it while the proton beam is on, we have all these peaks, we have all this background, this is, this is hopeless. So we started to pulse the beam beam on, beam off, and when we look at the beam off window, the, the background is decreased by orders of magnitude, and all of a sudden we can see these peaks better. And that's also something that's clinically done, especially if you do anything in, in, the, tora, in the, the, the body region, because you have breathing, so you would gate your treatment anyway. Like you breathe in, you treat, and then you breathe out, and that's when you stop treatment and forth and forth for breast cancer and for lung cancer and so on. So that's something that's already done clinically. So now we have to find a metal marker that has gamma rays that come out slightly delayed, so they are there in the beam off period, and the delay should be such that it fits a breathing cycle. So that kind of really narrows it down. So the one that we came up with is actually MOLLE. So if you have a MOLLE marker and a MOLLE uh, 92, if you have a PN reaction on it, you create technetium 92, and that then decays so, so that you have two lines, this one and this one, at 14 MeV. If you go to higher energy, like 27, they're gone. But the same metal, MOLLE92, uh, then undergoes a PD reaction to make MOLLE91, which then decays, and has this line that pops up that is not there at the lower energy. So we really have two peaks that come and go at different energies, and all we have to do is to measure the ratio of it. Uh, 
Uh, and so we did that with these uh, lanthanum and chromite detectors. They don't have very good energy resolution. As you can see, that looks pretty crappy, but that's what we had at the time. And this is what it um, actually um, then translates to. So with the ratio that we measure, depending on where, but if we place the markers, and that's specific to that marker metal, about four millimeters in front of the tumor, we can say what the range is and the uncertainty down to about 0 0.4 millimeters. The best technique right now, the very, very best technique right now is 1.5 millimeters. So you're talking about a factor of three if you're hitting an organ at risk or not. So this is, this is huge. This is quite big. Um, so this is uh, what we did in 2018. Uh, then we applied for funding and we were lucky enough to get a fund. So we then bought a, a high purity germanium detector and repeated the experiment last summer. Here you see Christina setting up the, uh, the detector. And this is the raw spectrum that you get out. And you can see already, so these are the different energies, the different colors are the different energies at some peaks change height depending on the energy. And Eva and Christina are currently analyzing the data. And we're also lucky enough to actually get a day of beam time at NSCL next month. So we're gonna try the same technique also with heavy ice. We got an oxygen 16 beam. So yeah, that's where that is. But why can't we use um, protons as flash? I mean, we treat it Normally, proton therapy, like everything else, is 20 to 30 treatments. At Triumph, we actually only did four fractions. We did hyperfractionation because the tumor was so hard to kill. <coughs> but we could also use protons to make flash therapy, especially at Triumph. So our dose rate is a little higher than typically. We are doing about 0 0.5 grays per second. But we have very large cyclotron, very high flux. We can actually go, if I just do the math, to 10,000 grays per second. So we're right now looking for um, funding to, to upgrade our facility so we could actually go to um, flash rates. And uh, the proton therapy vendors that sell these big facilities already advertise. So what they are doing is, so if you here have the, the, the cancer, and this is again the, uh, the distribution, so you have a lot of dose and then the exponential decay. Um, the vendors to get these high flash dose rates, the Bragg peak is actually behind the patient, not in the patient, because if you're reducing energies, if you're shaping the beam, each one of these actions reduces your flux rate. So they're throwing away the Bragg peak advantage of the spatial conformity and also the higher LET. Um, something that I forgot to say, um, Ions are high LET throughout. Protons are a little funny in the sense that protons are low LET at the beginning and only high LET in the Bragg peak. So they're throwing that away. But we are trying, because of our high rates, we can actually put the, the Bragg peak right into the tumor, and that's what we wanted to try. Okay, so, so we talked about external beam therapy with low LET and with high LET, and you can increase your LET even further if you're using ions, for example, carbon ions instead of protons. So here's a, a similar plot again, tumor, depth in tumor and the dose. Here you have the photons. This is a spread out Bragg peak to really cover the tumor if you would do it with protons. If you now use carbon ions, you have even more cell kill in the tumor for the same cell kill to the healthy tissue. But now the, the carbon ions can fragment on their way, so you still have a small tail now. But this is done uh, in Europe and in Asia. And the U.S. is now thinking finally about also having a, a heavy iron facility for treatment. Okay, but sometimes you can't actually use an external beam because sometimes you have this. So this is a prostate um, cancer patient out of Heidelberg in Germany. And uh, this patient had surgery, had chemotherapy, had hormone therapy, had some other form of radiation therapy, and all these treatments failed. So that patient had only two um, months to live. And in Germany, then, you can qualify for uh, um, experimental treatment. Um, so all these black spots are metastas metastasis from the, the primary tumor, most of them, not all of them. And this picture is made with a PET scan. So you're taking a protein like PSMA, and you're attaching a PET um, a positron emitter to it, gallium 68 and that accumulates then in these uh, cancer cells, and you can see there's a lot of uh, the cancer actually in the bone, and you can make this picture. And now, um, th 
the chemists in, in my group will be very upset with me, but in principle what you can do is you can take that molecule and instead of attaching the gallium-68 to it, you can attach a radioisotope onto it that sends something out that's really, really good at killing cancer cells. And when, you, when they did that in this case, they attached an alpha emitter, actinium-225 to it, and this is what happened. So this was published in 2016, and that caused an incredible stir in the community. People got really excited. They thought, wow, because these metastatic cancer are notoriously difficult to treat, we have something that can now kill, maybe not just prostate cancer, maybe they can kill other cancer as well that we normally can't treat. Um, there's just a little hiccup. There isn't enough actinium-225 around right now. So to this date, there are only about could be a little more, but a year ago it was just 11 clinical trials with actinium-225 and bismuth-213, which is one of its daughter products. And it's really, really exciting because 640 of these patients, you can see that's really not that many patients, uh, 60 to 80 percent actually showed a response for prostate cancer. And the number is different uh, depending on where you're doing it. If you're doing it in South Africa, it turns out that South African black men have way more aggressive prostate cancer, so they are more in the 60 percent range, and then other, other men is more in the 80 percent range. So that's an incredible high number for a reaction to, to a treatment. So the pharmaceutical industry, they want to treat um, about 50,000 patients a year just to do proper clinical trials. And why are clinical trials so important? I mean, this is, and I mean, he went on years to live, and he will, uh, died of unrelated causes, however you can define unrelated causes. Um, but you, what you also see is a lot of black here. So that protein didn't just attach to the tumor, it also attached to the saliva glands in your mouth. They got wiped out completely. So that patient had severe dry mouth. Now it doesn't sound that traumatic, but it seriously affects your quality of life. So you want to have some biological molecule that doesn't do that. And one of our collaborators at the Cancer Agency in Vancouver is actually working exactly on that. He thinks he has found a protein that will go to the cancer, but not to the saliva glands. But you have to try it out. So you need this actinium to try it out. And uh, so you can, so most of the actinium that was around originally is from legacy stockpile uh, from the Cold War. So there isn't that much around. The production was about 10 curies per year, uh, which is enough for a couple of hundred patients, and that's about it. So people started looking into producing actinium directly by irradiating thorium. And uh, it turns out that Triumph has the ideal energy to do that uh, with our 500 MeV cyclotron. So we are producing actinium here at the end of this beam line. So the beam comes from the main cyclotron, it goes through these different targets, serves all these different experiments, but at the end we still have really, really high flux. We have still 100 microamps of protons, and we still have 450 MeV of energy. So, and they, of course, go into a dump. We need to safely take care of those protons. So we can put our production target right, so here is the dump, right in front of the dump, and we can just run the target parasitically. So whenever beam goes down the beam line, we can produce actinium-225, which is about eight to nine months out of the year where we can do that. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, but if you do that, if you do... Um, Station on thorium, so it's thorium-232, you're not just producing actinium. You're producing hundreds of other isotopes. Also, some of them are actually interesting for medical reasons. But actinium is really interesting because it's not just sending out one alpha particle, it actually sends out four alpha particles. So you get four higher T particles for the price of one. Uh, you we can also, of course, look at the, uh, the parent mm -hmm. isotope, which is radium-225, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Okay, so you produce all of these. Now, you need to get rid of the other ones, and there are chemical procedures how you can separate chemically one, one um, atom, one element from the others. So if we are um, separating actinium, we're getting not just actinium-225, but 20, 24, 26, they're short-lived, we don't care about them, but we're also making 227, which is long-lived, which would go into the, the body. It's a bone seeker, so it would accumulate into your bones. And if you're unlucky enough, it may cause secondary cancer down, down the road because the bone is one of these organs that's very sensitive to, to radiation. But what if we are separating the radium? Um, so if you're doing that, this one uh, decays fairly quickly, so we don't care about that. We just wait for that to decay. 
These ones go in the way down, which is a gas, which we don't care about. And then these two decay in the actinium-225, the one that we want, and this one is again short-lived. So we are proposing to actually produce the radium, separate the radiums, and then using them as a generator to make actinium-225. When we did that, so that's a Monte Carlo simulation, if we're doing producing it directly, uh, we're making about 0.2% of actinium-227. Now, is that significant? Would that really cause secondary cancer? We don't know. We would have to do the clinical trials. But if we're doing the other technique where we're doing the radium first and then separate the radium, we basically have nothing in actinium. I'm showing you the Monte Carlo simulations because when we measure it, we can't measure anything. So we've done both ways, and we think we can make actinium-225 basically really pure. Uh, so we designed a target for that. Um, we over-engineered it to make sure that it's safe because if that target fails, um, our back hall of the, the Mason Hall will be slightly radioactive and it will be very popular. And uh, this is Andrew who then developed the target and the chemical to then to separate the, the radium and the actinium and we did some really, really good ones. Uh, but these numbers are pretty small because we didn't want to have that much activity to do initial tests where you're doing the work by hand. So we're now working on ramping everything up and scaling everything up, and we think that by the end of this year, maybe the spring of next year, we, we can have really big quantities so we can really do a lot of clinical trials with, with that isotope. Um, the same we will do at the aerial facility. Um, so the aerial facility basically takes beam from the e but put on beam lines. And the idea is to that go through it, go into a dump, and we'll here again, and it will run in parallel. Uh, energy, and this is the energy in the production target for us, for the medical isotope, really, really good. We got a CFI grant to install that uh, for $10 million, years, uh, $10 million, and we think we're going to have that facility up and going for 24, 25. Okay, so I hope I showed you a little bit about all the radiotherapy uh, project that we're doing at Triumph, starting with the, uh, the flash, photon flash facility at our new ELINAC, the photon therapy with the, uh, the, the optical fibers and the range verification, and then the alpha particles, uh, alpha um, emitters that we're trying to produce. Uh, this is our group, um, our funding, and thank you.